Hello everyone, thank you for watching this and allowing me into your homes. It is indeed a very strange time. We are so used to gathering in church of coming into God's house, if I can use that phrase. It seems strange to think that we can't do that at the moment. But I would remind you that wherever the faithful are, God is. And so your house, where you are at the moment, is also God's house. His presence is with you. He receives your prayers wherever you are. He listens to your worship and enjoys it, even if you sing flat or out of tune and can't remember the words or get it wrong doesn't matter. He delights in the praises of his people. But sometimes I think that when, when we're in a different place, uh, physically, we can forget that it is God's place. So as we prepare to share this act of, of worship and reflection, I invite you just to still yourself, to find the peace of the moment, whatever this moment is, whether it's in the middle of the day or at night or whenever, it doesn't matter. And in that, to acknowledge that it's God's house. Even though it's your home, it's God's house. And you're going to worship him with your heart and your thoughts and your prayers and your reflection. And that this moment is a church service, for want of a better word. And as you do that, that your spirit joins with everybody else who's doing it. And it rises as a fragrant offering to God. So I thought we'd start with just a couple of uh, short worship songs. Both from Mission Praise uh, 31, Come and Praise and Royal Priesthood, and 253, We Have Come Into His House. And as we share these, please just don't just think of it as music, think of it as an expression of your understanding that God is with you. Come and praise Him. Royal priesthood, come and worship, holy nation, worship Jesus, our Redeemer, He is praised. King of glory, come and praise him, royal priesthood, come and worship, holy nation, worship Jesus. Forget about yourself. 
Concentrate on Him and worship Him. So forget about yourself. Concentrate on Him and worship Him. So forget about yourself. Concentrate on Him and worship Christ the Lord. Worship Him, Christ the Lord. Let us lift up holy hands and magnify His name. Worship Him. Let us lift up holy hands and magnify His name and worship Him. Let us lift up holy hands and magnify His name and worship Christ our Lord. Well, this is the last in our series on Mind the Gap. And it's been a bit of a meandering journey over the last few weeks trying to see ways in which we can narrow those gaps or thin the divisions between the different compartments of our lives so that we can live with authenticity, integrity, honesty, faithfulness. But I think most of all with hope. Hope is such a powerful tool in our faith and in our well-being. Hope is not just wishful thinking that things will not always be as they are. That's secular hope. And that can often fly in the face of the evidence and experience. Just wishing things were different does not make them so. But hope for people of faith has to be an active expectation of God's involvement and his transformative and redemptive plan and purpose, not just for us, but for the whole world. And with that in mind, let us hear our reading from Romans for today. The reading is taken from Romans chapter 8, verses 18 to 39. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who has subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in pains of childbirth until now, and not only the creation but we ourselves who gave the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemptions of our bodies. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes what he sees? For if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. 
and he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he also foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. Hope is that light through the dark night of the journey of our lives. And we'll have plenty of dark nights in our lives. We just need to look at Paul's list of sufferings and deprivations, his dark nights. And yet through them all, he still had hope. Even if he had nothing else, he had hope. Hope for the world, hope for life and living. And that transformed his view of the world. And ultimately closed the gaps in his lives. Remember where he started as one who persecuted Christians, who hated them with passion, and now so different. Hope transformed him. He had a hope for creation, a creation that would be again transformed to God's plan, a restorative hope that Eden would once again be around us. The place we lost through sin and ever since creation has wept and groaned for that breach of relationship. Revelation holds the promise in the prophetic words of John that God's plan is to renew and restore his creation and that it will merge with the new heaven and it will all be one. <coughs> If this creation is central to God's plan, we would do well to think about how we treat it, how we use it, how we preserve it, how we bless it. Paul had faith for living, even in the face of his own death. As one who lived in the ancient version of death row for years, he knew of deep, deep darkness around him. He knew that truth, death, the 
is the biggest gap maker of all. But the resurrection is the greater gap closer. It must be hard for those who live without faith to gaze at the grave and see only their own mortality without a hope in life beyond this. To see this life as all that there is. <coughs> I find that depressing. <coughs> you just need to look at the world around you and you think if this is it, you can keep some of it. The Christian hope though is that this isn't all that there is. The hope that there is more. There is an abundance beyond this. That there is a life beyond this limitation. And it's as, it's as if we are living in the prelude to real life. Life that will go on forever. And that engenders a hope that we may know that life in us. And as the scripture reminds us, that, that life is in Christ. And so to know the full stature of Christ in us, to experience true Christ-likeness. And yet so many give up on that journey towards God. But why? Well, some simply drift. They start on the journey of faith. But life and events causes them to lose attention and they drift. We all know that feeling of being in a classroom on a sunny day and the most boring subject that we ever have to study. And as we gaze out the window suddenly there's a dull buzzing in our ears and we drift. And we're not paying attention. So it is with our faith. We start fully intent and motivated and then life gets busy and, and other things take our attention and we drift. In class, we might have been reminded by the shout of sharp, pay attention and a bit of chalk bouncing off your head. <clears throat> they were allowed to do that back then. But life, family, work, career all become distractions beyond the window that cause us to drift. We stop going to church as regu regularly as we used to until we barely go at all. We stop reading the Bible as much because we're well, really busy. We stop praying, well, until something calamitous happens and we're desperate and then we pray a lot. We would think ourselves as Christian, but it's a very basic form of faith because we've never taken it into the very deep parts of our lives. We've never let it grow and develop. We've stuck it in the cupboard because we've drifted off. Occasionally we let it out and visit Christmas, Easter, funerals, weddings. But we've created a gap round it and the rest of our lives. And wonder why it doesn't feel like it has any impact or any meaning on those other parts. Others go through a breakup with God. Events that are hard. And he doesn't come riding over the horizon like the 7th Cavalry to the rescue. And so God gets the blame. And we let go. We storm off in a half. Either that or the shiny things of the world seem to offer sparkle that's better than the things of God. To our human eye at least. And we follow the sparkle. Like a cat chasing a spot of light on the carpet or on the wall. But mindless as to who is moving that light? Who's in control of that light? Still others again feel that they have failed God and fallen short and so they give up. They settle for some diminished faith. They, they can't deny God's there. But they feel so inadequate 
that they cannot see themselves as a vital part of God's plan and God's purpose. And they've got to let go. The events of life are too hard. Loss, suffering, grief, despair. Perhaps they expected God to be their talisman, their get-out-of-jail-free card, their ticket to avoid all that sort of stuff, and they simply let go. Narrowing the gaps in our lives is not an easy thing to do, and it will not happen overnight, even though we may wish that it would. A life of faith is a persistent and purposeful journey in one direction, towards God, no matter the terrain or the events or the circumstances of our lives. A determination to follow, to follow Jesus and to engage with the world and others as he did. And he is still doing it through and in us. It is a process of integrating the whole of our lives into a single way of being with integrity and authenticity. People are attracted to honest, authentic people. Just look at Jesus, they flocked to him. There were no gaps or, or divisions in his life. Samuel Rutherford, the 17th century Scottish minister, said that he had his feet on the ground, his hand to the plough, and his heart in heaven. Sounds about right to me. If you've become aware of gaps or divisions in your life over the last few weeks, don't be too hard on yourselves. We all have them. But in hope and in expectation of God's plan and purpose for you, hand them over to Christ and allow him to show you how to close them. Through him. Not through your efforts. Not through your industry. Not through your sweat and tears and blood and pain and anguish. Christ's already done that for you. It's called the cross. It's called Gethsemane. It's called the tomb. And he rose for us. That we may have hope for the whole of our lives. For all that we are. All that we can be. And that even in times such as this, we are not abandoned. We have hope. We do not need to be afraid. For God is with us. Amen. Heavenly Father, as we take time to pray, we seek hope, hope in difficult days, hope for the future, hope that will give us strength, clarity of purpose and vision, hope to share as well as to keep. So within us your hope we pray. And as we pray, <clears throat> We bring before you the needs of those we love and care for. We pray for friends, church family members that we know are in hospital or struggling with their health and well-being today. And fold them in your love and in your mercy, we pray. But grant them hope, we pray. That they can come through this time renewed and strengthened. We pray for governments at all levels, local and national, as they seek to <coughs> steer, <coughs> steer our way through these difficult days. And as we come to a point of easing constraint, give them wisdom to know how to do that that will not cause a, a second wave of this virus to sweep through our nations. Lord, as we pray, we bring before you 
the needs of our lives, the needs of friends and loved ones, asking you to listen, to hear and to answer. Hear us now as we pray first for our friends and family. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear our prayer, Lord, for the nations, for lands that are struggling with poverty and corruption, with violence and warfare, as well as the pandemic and everything else that it's bringing. Lord, hear us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear our prayers for our church, not just our local church, but the churches of Jesus across this land and across the world, that we can show a different way of being, to proclaim your gospel, not just in words, but in lives. Lord, hear us. Lord, in your great mercy, hear our prayers. Hear our prayers, O Father, for ourselves, our needs, our hopes and fears. All of our prayers, God, we give to you. Hear us and answer through Christ our Lord. Amen. As we bring this act of worship to a close, I thought we could share a, 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 a golden oldie. Again, from Mission Praise 279. <clears throat> I know not why God's wondrous grace to me has been made known. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me has been
But I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I committed unto him against that day. Yes, I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I committed unto him against that day. As you have committed yourself to God, so he is able to keep you and will keep you, not just today, but forever. And may the hope of our faith fill you to overflowing. May it secure you in the knowledge of God's love for you, guide you, guard you, and bless you and those that you love, now and always. Amen.